Hi, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is April 7th, 2021, and this is part nine of my video series, Passover, Not Easter. This video is called Guardians of the Testimony. I want to start by reading Revelation chapter 19, a little bit from that, starting in verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the Kodeshim. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet. This is John falling down. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The English Standard Version ends the quote after the words worship God and does not include for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But I believe that that was what the angel said as well because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus, the testimony of our Messiah, of our, our Lord, our King, our Creator. That's the spirit of prophecy. That's the essence of prophecy. Jesus is the stumbling stone. That's where everyone goes astray. Everyone who misses the mark, miss it because they will not accept the fact that Jesus is the one who means everything, that did everything for us. And it's only through him and because of him that we ever make it into the kingdom of God. The Kodeshim, the first fruits of God, the firstborn of God, and then the bride of Christ, they are the guardians of the testimony. I want to read now from Revelation 14 before I move into um, discussing this in more detail because. Revelation 14 is very important to read along with the previous video, video that I did concerning the hour that we live in now and watching with Christ during this hour. This is the hour that we need to be awake and aware. So Revelation 14, 1, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who who have been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. These 144,000 are, I believe, the man child that's discussed in Revelation chapter 12. And they are the first fruits unto God. They are the ones who will, I believe, prepare the bride so that the bride herself 
is ready at the appropriate time. They sang a song that no one else could learn. They're the only ones. Well, in Revelation 15, you have this in verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had overcome the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So this song is a song that is the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. It's the song of the law and the grace. It's the song of justice and it's the song of mercy. The servants of God, the 144,000 have to have the law written on their hearts, but they also have to have the mercy of God within their hearts. So verse 3 again, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. You alone are holy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus, you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. So we are on the verge of seeing the righteous acts of our God revealed. Now I want to turn back quickly to chapter 14. Right after the first fruits of God are introduced in verses 1 through 5, then verse 6 says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So notice this mentions the hour again. And But what happens in this hour? Verse 6. An angel flies overhead with an eternal gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, is going to go forth to every nation and tribe and language and people. Then verse 8, another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen, is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So you have these things happening at the same time. You have the fall of Babylon, but you now have the everlasting gospel going out in power with great glory. And then verse 9 and 10, And another angel, a third, followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is the application of God's law to them. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Their torment lasts as long as they refuse to repent. Then verse 12, here is a call for the endurance of the Kodeshim, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So remember that passage from Revelation 14 with respect to the hour that we live in. And now I want to begin to explain what I mean by being guardians of the testimony. Moses 
the man of God, the servant of God. Moses was the grandson of Levi, one of the twelve sons of Jacob, whom God renamed Israel. Moses wrote the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt. God appointed his brother Aaron as the first high priest of Israel when he established the nation of Israel after freeing them from Pharaoh. From that time, Aaron's son served as the priests of Israel. But Aaron's sons were only part of only one of the eight clans of the Levite tribe. In Numbers 3, verses 14 through 20, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, List the sons of Levi by fathers' houses and by clans. Every male from a month old and upward you shall list. So Moses listed them according to the word of the Lord, as he was commanded. And these were the sons of Levi by their names, Gershon and Kohath and Merari. Those are the three sons of Levi. And these are the names of the sons of Gershon by their clans, Libni and Shemai, and the sons of Kohath by their clans, Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel. And the sons of Merari by their clans, Mali and Mushi. These are the clans of the Levites by their father's houses. I may have said that Levi was the grandfather um, of Moses, but it's clear from this that he would have been the great grandfather of Moses. Aaron's descendants formed only a small part. My recollection is that Amram was Moses' father, who was the son of Kohath. So you have Levi, Kohath, Amram, and then uh, Moses and Aaron. That was Numbers 3, verses 14 through 20. Aaron's descendants formed only a small part of the Levite tribe, and they were given a very special role in their service to God by being chosen as priests of the Most High. But the rest of the Levites were not forgotten by God. He chose them to replace all of the firstborn sons of Israel and then consecrated them in order that they would serve him. Now we saw when we looked into that previously that the Levites serve as a prophetic type of all overcomers who will one day comprise the biblical man-child revealed in Revelation 12. Now let's consider another function for these overcomers and their very high position in the government of God. We're going to read from Numbers chapter 1, verses 47 to 54. But the Levites were not listed along with them by their ancestral tribe. For the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Only the tribe of Levi you shall not list, and you shall not take a census of them among the people of Israel. But appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony. See, that's the name of the tabernacle of Moses. It was the tabernacle of the testimony. And over all its furnishings and over all that belongs to it. They are to carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings. And they shall take care of it and shall camp around the tabernacle. When the tabernacle is to set out, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, that means put up, the Levites shall set it up. And if any outsider comes near, he shall be put to death. The people of Israel shall pitch their tents by their companies each man in his own camp and each man by his own standard. But the Levite shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony so that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the people of Israel. In other words, that they don't get too close to the holiness of God. And the Levite shall keep guard over the tabernacle of the testimony. Thus did the people of Israel. They did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. That was Numbers 1, verses 47 to 54. Moses makes, it, makes something very clear here. He says, he doesn't just say the Levites shall be responsible for the tabernacle. Three times 
he uses the phrase, the tabernacle of the testimony. Anyone can build a tent or a tabernacle, but only God can oversee the building, caring for, and protection of the tabernacle of the testimony. So we need to find out what is the testimony. Strong's Concordance says that the word testimony is translated from the Hebrew word eduth and is translated as either testimony or witness in the King James Version. Remember, a witness gives testimony. If you have a witness in a trial, the lawyer always asks him questions and that witness then gives testimony. And in order for that testimony to be received, it has to be an eyewitness. It can't be hearsay. It's not based upon what somebody else said. It's based upon what they themselves saw. Strong's also says that the word comes from the Hebrew word aid and means a witness or abstractly testimony. So you would have um, those two ideas again. The King James Version only translates that word as witness. The context within the verses where this word is used shows that it typically means to be a witness for the truth of some particular matter. Again, think of a court and a witness who gives testimony. Now the word translated testimony first occurs in Exodus chapter 16, verse 34. And I'm going to read verses 31 to 34 here. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. So this uh, manna is to be kept as a witness of what God did in the wilderness. Now verse 34, Exodus 16, 34, looks forward to the time when Aaron actually placed the jar of manna next to the testimony within the ark of the testimony. And the testimony itself is the written law. And we'll get into that here in a minute. At this particular time, God had not yet given the testimony to Moses. He was talking to Moses before that. Now, the following passage first reveals God's commands concerning this ark of the testimony. This is Exodus 25, verses 10 through 22. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. Um, a cubit was a foot and a half, uh, sometimes one foot and nine inches. So this was a big uh, box. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and outside shall you overlay it. And you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet. Two rings on the one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. So the poles are to be left in the ark once it's made. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. Okay, now you, you might wonder, why... Is God so specific here? And then if you will take the time to actually read 
the instructions God gave to Moses for building the tabernacle. It's amazing how detailed the instructions are. Well, there's a, there is a profound purpose for that. The purpose is because it proves that these were instructions that God gave Moses. That is the testimony. That's why this is called a testimony, because these are the literal words of God spoken to man. What other religion is there that has the literal words of God still in one place that we can go and find? See, that's the amazing thing about the Bible, about the scripture. It is the word of God. And that is the testimony. So now moving on to verse 17 of Exodus 25. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim, now these would be and you see pictures of cherubim in the book of Ezekiel. So these are um, spiritual beings with wings. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Again, that was Exodus 25, verses 10 to 22. Now God gave Moses the first writing of his testimony at the end of Moses' first 40-day visitation with God on the mountain of God. Scripture says in Exodus 31, 18, And he gave to Moses when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. The two tablets of the testimony. On them were the Ten Commandments. That was Exodus 31, verse 18. It was during this time that Israel fell into idolatry with the golden calf because the nation did not know what had become of him. Moses was so outraged when he came down the mountain and saw their sin and idolatry that he threw down and broke the two tablets God had given him. You would have thought that he would have been fearful to break what God had just given him, wouldn't you? But Moses was outraged. After this ordeal, God invited Moses up the mountain again. In the following passage, Moses reveals the testimony which God gave him to put into the Ark of the Testimony, which in turn was put in the tabernacle of the testimony. So, um, this is a long passage I'm going to read. This is Exodus chapter 34, verses 1 to 29, but it's so powerful and important. Important. I'm going to go ahead and read all of it. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. That's kind of funny, which you broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the, in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. You were dealing with God here, okay? So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, Yahuwah, Yahuwah, a God, an Elohim, merciful and gracious, 
slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. We see that children pay the penalty for their father's sin because they get into sinful patterns of behavior themselves. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Yahuwah, please let Yahuwah go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, stiff-necked like the donkey. That's why the donkey's neck had to be broken if, if you did not sacrifice a lamb for the firstborn of the donkey. And pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. And God said, Behold, I am making a covenant before all your people, I will do marvels, such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their ashram, their ashram, their asherah. Another word, I believe, for Ishtar, after which Easter is named. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And when... They whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods and make your sons whore after their gods. So God is telling Moses, you are to be a separate people unto me, a kingdom of priests. Verse 17 in Exodus 34, you shall make for yourself you shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. 18. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib, first month of the new year for Israel. For in the month of Abib you came out from Egypt. All that open the womb are mine. All your male livestock, the firstborn of cow and sheep, the firstborn of donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. And that is a principle we ought still to live by. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to take one particular day a week, but you need to you need to live in rest. You know, read... Uh, Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. We still are to enter into the rest of God. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. You shall observe the feast of weeks. So this means even in busy time you are to rest. You shall observe the feast of weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will cast out nations before you and enlarge your borders. No one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. So he's saying, I will protect your land. Don't worry about someone coming up to take your land. I will protect you as when you obey me. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened. And we discussed what that means. Leaven represents sin and hypocrisy. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a seven-day feast for you to get the sin and the hypocrisy out of your life. That's what it means prophetically. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the sacrifice of the Feast of Passover remain until the morning. 
The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now this is the second 40 days and 40 nights. Moses had just been up there 40 days and 40 nights. So he basically is with God for a total of 80 days. And he didn't eat bread or water. He was being fed by the Spirit of God. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain... Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. So again, that's Exodus 34, verses 1 through 29. Now verse 28 here says that the writing on the tablets of the testimony was the Ten Commandments. It is not clear whether the tablets of the testimony included only the Ten Commandments, which are recounted in Exodus chapter 20, or if they included the other laws mentioned here in Exodus 34 above, or the many laws Moses wrote down in Exodus chapters 21 through 24. One thing, however, is clear, and that is that these tablets contain the very words of God, which included commands for how Israel was to live in consecration and holiness before him. They define the standard of relationship he demanded from his people. These tablets, therefore, were the testimony to the covenant, to the relationship between God and man. Thus we see that God specifically chose the Levites to guard and protect not only the physical structure of the tabernacle, but the literal testimony or truth of God's covenant with Israel. This written testimony resided within the ark, which stood itself in the most holy place of the tabernacle of testimony. The innermost place in the tabernacle. And it is exactly this which defines the work of those currently called to overcome and become part of the man-child. The Kodeshim, the holy ones, the overcomers. They have come out of Babylon. They have refused to take the mark of the beast. Babylon is the satanic system and the satanic religion that rules the world. It is a defiled mixture of every religion, including Satanism and including Christianity. But it's Babylon the Great is the satanic religion that rules the entire world, and it's about to be destroyed. They do not, the Kodeshim, the overcomers, do not hold to Babylon's doctrines, and thus they are cast out and shunned from churches when they dare to speak the truth that they know. The very words of God have been and still are being written upon their hands, upon their head, their minds, and upon their hearts. So rather than taking the mark of the beast, because until today, the mark of the beast, men have taken the mark of the beast for thousands of years. The mark of the beast is, what do you put in your mind? Is it Satan's thoughts? Or is it God's thoughts? The mark of the beast on your hand, what do you do with your hands? Are they doing Satan's work? Or are they doing God's work? You see, the mark of the beast has been with us forever. And people have either taken the mark of the beast or they have taken the mark of God. Which one have you taken? Now, can you repent? Are you done? Are you going to hell forever if you've taken the mark of the beast? Well, of course not. There could be no salvation because everyone 
took the mark of the beast before they believed in Jesus Christ. So upon the people of God, upon the Kodeshim, the very words of God have been and still are being written upon their hands, upon their minds, and upon their hearts. And like Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, great-grandson of Levi, who slew the fornicating idolaters of Israel, you should read about that, the Kodashim will not rest until all carnal flesh has been destroyed by God's word. See, they destroy the carnal flesh by the word of God. These are the ones who rule with a rod of iron. The rod of iron is the word of God. And finally, I want to remind you of the scripture from Isaiah 8 concerning the testimony because it's critical for us to understand this. Chapter 8, verse 11. 11 to 22. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel. See, this is the stumbling stone. This is talking about Jesus. The Lord of hosts, Jesus. Jesus will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel. He is the stumbling stone. Jesus, God made flesh a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. This is verse 16 of Isaiah 8. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. God generally hides himself. You know, he doesn't just come out and show you a shining figure and say, I'm God. Believe in me. He, you know, it needs to become something to us. It needs to mean something to us. It is the pearl of great price. We sell all in order to gain that. I will wait for the Lord. I will wait for Yahuwah who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. And I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom Yahuwah has given me are signs and portents in Israel from Yahuwah of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Jesus and the children that the Father gives to Jesus are for signs and portents prophetic signs to people. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, this is all the new age mumbo jumbo we're hearing these days. It's just amazing to me the things that we're hearing. So when they say to you, inquire of these people who really hear things in the spirit, you know, mediums, necromancers, people who channel demons, Isaiah then says, should not a people inquire their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. So that's what he says. Don't get caught up in the distractions. Don't listen to the false prophets. Don't listen to the new age prophets who don't know Jesus Christ yet. 
A lot of them, I believe, really want to see good. They do not know they're deceived. But to the law and to the testimony, where is it? It's in the scripture. It's in the word of God. It's in the Bible. Listen to my videos. Listen to my teachings. To the law and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. It is because they have no light in them. They will pass through the land, greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. And they will be thrust into thick darkness. And then amazingly, chapter 9 of Isaiah then moves into the revelation of Jesus Christ, the Son is born, the Son is given. So we we now are at the time of great gloom, great darkness, great distress. This is the hour. The guardians of the testimony are about to rise. The guardians of the testimony are about to be glorified. I believe it could be this year. I don't know. The Lord has not told me. Glenn, it's going to happen on this day. But one of the reasons why I'm continuing with this series, Passover, not Easter, is because we are now coming up upon Second Passover. Second Passover is the day of April 26th. And then there is what would be the second Feast of First Fruits that is the following weekend on Sunday morning. And that is the morning of April 2nd. So we're there. Could be this year. I hope it's this year. There's incredible chaos in the world, incredible destruction going on right now. My prayer is that we are not going to see wholesale destruction. I'm still holding on to hope that the Kodeshim are going to be glorified, the 144,000 are going to be glorified, and that the rule of God will then begin. And because of that, the great destruction will be averted. And... The next video in this series is going to deal with that in more detail. It's going to basically be the Malachi prophecy. May be blessed in the name of Jesus, our Messiah our Lord, our Savior. Amen.